College and Complex has come to order. My name is Tim. I'd like to welcome everybody tonight to the College and Complexes. The College and Complexes consists of the following format. We first have a brief announcements period, then our speaker will speak. Then we have a question and answer period, followed by our infamous rebuttal period. There are two basic rules of the College and Complexes. One is one fool at a time. The second, well, let's introduce our speaker tonight. Dr. Robert Holland, his presentation on Revenge of the Nerds, the technocratic takeover of the public sphere. I don't want to get into his long wordy introduction and the thing, but let's just welcome Dr. Robert Holland. before the College of Complexes. I'm not a regular here. I don't come every Saturday, as many of you do. But uh, I think over more than a decade, I've been a regular speaker. So this is my, my 12th attempt, or 12th offering. Those of you who have complained in the past that my theses are too arch, or too obscure, or too arcane, and that my language is too cryptic or recondite or prolix. I've heard your complaints, but frankly, I am determined to keep the level of my presentation at least at the level of a television news broadcast, usually pitched at the level of a ninth grader. But of course, I think that would have been a standard established in 1965. So those of you who have not benefited from a um, public school education from a 1965 era may have received something, something degraded since that time. But again, judging from the look of the room and all the gray hair and some of the bald heads like mine, uh, I suspect most of you have probably done well in your public educations. So the epigraph that I asked Chuck Paydock to publish is a little obscure. It's by Montesquieu, and I've already been told tonight that it requires translation. I won't translate it, but rather I will draw your attention to the final statement, which is the launching point for my presentation tonight. As to men of overgrown estates, everything which does not contribute to advance their power and honor is considered by them as an injury. So a man of overgrown estate in the era of Montesquieu was someone who's uh, land holdings and wealth assets had grown so large that it was overgrown. So who exactly are the technocrats? My suggestion is that almost all of us here tonight are technocrats or retired technocrats. The technocratic style of social organization is the default inherited from our forebears. So to meaningfully participate in society means to have imbibed technocracy like mother's milk, taken it into our hearts and supported it enthusiastically or captively. One could argue whether the origins of technocracy are found in the 17th century mechanical age or the Age of Enlightenment, commencing in the 18th century. Either way, the developing West shifted decisively away from the cultural and epistemological dominance 
of the Catholic Church toward widespread literacy, scientific discovery, technological development, and moral philosophy based on the ability of logic, reason, mechanisms, systems, and administrative prowess to orient and order the affairs of men toward progress, if not, in fact, perfectibility. Technical refinements over the past three centuries have accelerated matters precipitously and fundamentally altered the way mankind inhabits the earth. Technocracy possesses many aspects, but the central feature is how information is gathered, shaped, organized, and diffused. Here's where the nerds come in. It's especially those of us who did well in school, typically completing degrees in higher education, who perform technocratic functions. Knowledge workers, such as scientists, teachers, accountants, bankers, physicians, lawyers, military officers, publishers, and journalists comprise the technocratic core. They're closely related to what Thomas Frank calls the liberal professional class though his term tends to refer more narrowly to career public servants, now known as the deep state. Technocrats contrast with the working class. Considering the central function of information within technocracy, the worst among the technocrats are not scientists or researchers who make the discoveries and drive innovation, the teachers and professorate, or professoriate is the word, pardon me, who transmit the technological paradigm, or even librarians like Chuck Paydock, who function as both gatekeepers and enablers. And I chide Chuck as a librarian because I too used to be a, a librarian. Where? At Sibley Music Library in Rochester, New York. Rather, the worst technocrats are the government intelligence apparatus, technologists in industry, journalists in the mainstream media, and private banking consortia. Together, they control an immense wealth of knowledge, but do not wield it with neutrality. Instead, they use information as a tool, a resource, and a weapon to reinforce the technocracy and advance their own agendas. The lies, distortions, and predations of politicians, intelligence officers, bankers, and journalists are already well documented in the public sphere. However, I'd like to draw particular attention to the technologists in private industry, specifically social media giants such as Google, Twitter, and Facebook, and commercial giants such as Amazon, Microsoft, and Apple. Wikipedia, which I'll cite several times later also deserves mention, even though it's crowdsourced. By virtue of the public's participation in these private networks and subscription to services they provide, technology companies possess extraordinarily detailed knowledge of everyone's behaviors and beliefs, aggregated as big data but fine-grained enough to assemble individual profiles on anyone who's ever logged in signed up or hooked up an Amazon Echo or a Google Nest. Shoshana Zubhoff's book, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism from last year, tells how routine online interactions, so-called behavioral surplus, or also known as digital exhaust, have been so thoroughly commoditized that individual are now individuals are now the products being sold to marketers and political operatives, much like how TV's real purpose is to attract viewers to be delivered to advertisers, the true customers. So to complete my thesis, let me turn, return to the idea of revenge. Technocrats are not typically among the jocks, the bullies, the prom courts, and the cool kids at the top of the school-age hierarchy. Nearly everyone struggles in life to find their place in life, their own 
psychologically secure in-group. As a result, those less popular or less socially adept often suffer, sometimes keenly, from exclusions, indignities, and humiliations that are often felt as injustice, which in turn motivates them not to enact reprisals, but rather with a determination to leverage their unique skills and abilities to take revenge on their tormentors, as in, I'll show you, or I'll show them. I'll provide three examples of this. Campus agitation, of which many of us are familiar, it's a hot button issue these days, um, relating to social justice, which is now also creeping into the workplace, demands acknowledgement inclusion and blanket acceptance of all types of social variance. The argument goes that no one should be punished or excluded for being different somehow, even those on the radical fringe. On its face, this is a worthy goal, a resumption and refurbishing of the rights movements of the 1960s. However, this goal has promoted edge cases to the forefront. Usually it's a tiny fraction of people, such as those whose sexual or gender identity is atypical, who garner the most attention. Sufferers and their allies, also going by the acronym SJW, for Social Justice Warrior, may become ideologically possessed as either victims or victims by proxy, and then demand accommodations to be adopted and legislated, in the course of which science is denied in favor of make-believe and speech itself is weaponized, deepening the epistemological crisis occurring now throughout the, the culture. It's a revenge of sorts, but a pyrrhic victory, considering that intolerance is now considered thought crime and doublethink is needed to square the circle with the denial of science. A second example is the intellectual dark web, or the IDW, a term coined by Eric Weinstein to describe a group of new media thought leaders from all over the political and ideological spectrum who nonetheless share a belief that open inquiry and discussion are keys to addressing political and cultural frictions. Whereas SJWs adhere to politically correct orthodoxies, the IDW is confident not so much in its solutions or its answers, but rather its methodology. Some IDW members revel in their supposed membership, having finally achieved celebrity and cool factor for being in the vanguard, while others are more satisfied downplaying or ignoring their IDW cred. The podcast is the favored medium of exchange and influence for the IDW. A third example is the White House Correspondence Dinner, also known as the Nerd Prom, which is an annual gathering of journalists and politicians to roast the self-importance of the executive branch and its stenographers in the press. The dinner used to be hosted by a comedian and was a fairly unique example of speaking truth to power because unlike all the satirical news shows, the comedic targets were often in the very room with the person launching the bombs. Even though jokes hit their marks, the lasting effect was really only to congratulate the influential for being powerful and influential enough to withstand and later disregard the jokes. One notable exception was the 2011 White House Correspondents' Dinner when President Obama mocked Donald Trump mercilessly including the memorable line, I'm one thing you'll never be, the President of the United States. <laughs> Trump had flirted with political office for years, but this humiliation may have pushed him over the edge. 
despite having born into a life of privilege and failing upwards continuously, one failed business or bankruptcy after another, Donald Trump was nonetheless a nerdy outsider who arguably got the last laugh on Obama by succeeding him as president. Trump had been the butt of jokes for decades with his bizarre hairdo and the name Ivanka gave him, the Donald. But the experience at the White House correspondence dinner caused him as president to boycott the dinner and direct officials in his administrations to do likewise. This past year, the roast format has changed and the keynote address was instead given by an historian. So if you don't recognize yourself as a technocrat or as someone serving the technocracy, maybe I need to adapt Jeff, Jeff Foxworthy to suggest that you might just be a redneck, I mean, a technocrat. <laughs> if in fact, your hands lack the calluses and your muscles lack the fatigue of manual labor. Or if your wardrobe has more suits and business casual than work clothes, you might just be a technocrat. Or if you work in a climate-controlled interior, away from the rigors of exterior heat, cold, sun, wind, rain, and snow, you might just be a technocrat. <laughs> If you wear glasses from sitting in front of a screen all day, massaging information with your mind, you might just be a technocrat. Yep. If you know what initialisms, such as SJW, IDW, ALICE, FOMO, and FOBLO mean, you might just be a technocrat. If you know what an initialism is, you might just be a technocrat. So I could go on and on. But you understand that there's a big difference between the people who work mostly with their minds and the people who work mostly with their, their hands or their bodies, as it were. Industrialization and liberal democracy are the attributes most closely associated with the technical or the technocratic style of social organization, which coincides roughly with the modern era. Both spread from the British Empire and France, the political, economic, and cultural hotspots of the West in the 18th and 19th century, leading to widespread adoption of political economies based on, among other things, individual sovereignty and ownership of private property. While Britain and France led these historical developments, admiration bordering on envy motivated other countries to modernize and westernize in order to attempt to catch up with the ascended West, often resulting in rebellion and overthrow of oppressive monarchical governments. Tsarist Russia is one such example. Peter the Great, who reigned from 1682 to 1725, and Catherine the Great, who reigned from 1762 to 1796 were among despots and rulers who victimized their own peoples in pursuit of industrialization and imitation of urbane French and British models. In the Soviet era, it was Joseph Stalin who ruled from 1922 to 1955, whose five-year modernization plans are connected with purges and gulags. To, attach, to accomplish their goals. In his book, The Age of Anxiety, published in 2018, Pankaj Mishra discusses in detail projects to transform ancient regime monarchies in Northern Africa, the Middle East, and Russia into something pseudo-European. And here I quote. Cosseted writers and artists would, in the 20th century, transfer their, transform, pardon me, transfer their fantasies of an ideal society to Soviet leaders who seemed to be bringing a superhuman energy and progressive rhetoric to Peter the Great's rational schemes of social engineering. Stalin's Russia, as it ruefully eradicated its religious 
and evidently backward enemies in the 1930s came to constitute a quintessential Enlightenment utopia. But the Enlightenment philosophes had already shown in their blind adherence to Catherine how reason could degenerate into dogma. Extensive forms of domination, authoritarian state control structures, violent top-down manipulation of human affairs, often couched in terms of humanitarian concerns, and suffering to indifference, end of quote. The Enlightenment philosophes mentioned by Mishra were French salon intellectuals who promulgated Enlightenment values and ethics during the 18th century. One of the most influential was Voltaire, who lived from 1694 to 1778. Here is Mishra's characterization of those values. Modernization, mostly along capitalist lines, became the universalist creed that glorified the autonomous, rights-bearing individual and hailed his rational choice-making capacity as freedom. Economic growth was posited as the end-all of political life and the chief marker of progress worldwide, not to mention the gateway to happiness. Communism was totalitarianism. Ergo, its ideological opponent, American liberalism, represented freedom, which in turn was best advanced by money-making. End of quote. Thus, however significant cries of liberté, égalité, fraternité may have been during the late 18th century, the more fundamental transformation was the market economy and capitalism that launched in the West but quickly extended far beyond national boundaries and is now well established even in countries that do not embrace liberal democracy or pretend to as the United States does. <laughs> Capitalism has advanced inexorably across the globe as the defining characteristic of modernity, the crown jewel of the technocracy. Transforming how humans live on the planet took roughly three centuries, but is nearing completion in the era of globalization. Very few places in the world inhabited by significant human populations fail to be part of industrial civilization. Technocrats worked aggressively for this result by infiltrating and undermining traditional societies, which is to say, undeveloped pre-modern nations. It's an entirely different meaning of the term regime change. More insidiously, perhaps, principled resistance to this influence has been systematically overcome by use of economic and military force. I will discuss examples of resistance later. Just as the era of in the industrial era and burning of fossil fuels on a planetary scale triggered climate change, which is yet to manifest fully, Capitalism smuggled in its own unripened fruit, namely perpetual growth obligations and rendering of tribute to the ownership class. Examples of growth demands include population demographics, food, money, and energy supplies, measures of gross national product, and social security. Not all are straight up Ponzi schemes, but many folks recognized long ago that continuous growth must eventually reach a hard ceiling, or in more familiar terms, that there's no such thing as per a perpetual motion machine or infinite growth on a finite planet. Robert, uh, pardon me, Robert Malthus may have been disproven insofar as his calculations went, but the Malthusian bottleneck is true in principle. Simply put, energetic systems eventually run down as a function of the ironclad second law of thermodynamics. We're approaching hard ceilings in the 21st century, but have yet to accept the terminal diagnosis and act upon it. Indeed, our intransigence in the face of inevitable defeat finds us accelerating instead toward our own doom. In the cartoon universe of Toy Story, Buzz Lightyear exclaimed, to infinity and beyond, with no apparent awareness of the rhetorical vacuity of the slogan, 
something akin to the vacuum of space, perhaps. In the real world we inhabit, such nonsense is exceedingly dangerous. Malthus is not the first or only person to recognize that something new, something unprecedented, had developed from the Enlightenment and the scientific era, which later spawned the Industrial Revolution. Consider, for example, the Crystal Palace, a London exhibition space built in 1851 during the era of World's Fairs. The Crystal Palace was understood as a utopian symbol and embodiment of Western hubris, an expression of the sheer might of Western thought and its concomitant products. It was also a technical feat of engineering prowess and demonstration of economic power. The Russian novelist Fyodor Dostoevsky, who possessed unusual psychological sensitivity, visited the Crystal Palace in 1862 and recorded his visceral response. Here I quote, you become aware of a colossal idea. You sense that here something has been achieved, that here there is victory and triumph. You even begin vaguely to fear something. However independent you may be, for some reason you become terrified. For isn't this, this the achievement of perfection, you think? Isn't this the ultimate? Must you accept this as the final truth and forever hold your peace? It's also solemn, triumphant, and proud that you gasp for breath." End of quote. Describing the world historical import of the Crystal Palace, Dostoevsky wrote further. Here I quote again. Look at these hundreds of thousands, these millions of people humbly streaming here from all over the earth. People come here with a single thought, quietly, relentlessly, mutely thronging onto this colossal palace. And you feel something final has taken place here, that something has come to an end. It is like a biblical picture, something out of Babylon, a prophecy from the apocalypse coming to pass before your eyes. You sense that it would require great and everlasting spiritual denial and fortitude in order not to submit, not to capitulate before the impression, not to bow before what is, and not to deify Baal, that is, not to accept the material world as your ideal." End of quote. So I have to admit these quotes are kind of a mouthful, a lot to absorb all at once. Um, let me draw attention especially to this last phrase, not to accept the material world as your ideal. Because that has a strong resonance with the way we live now, where the lives of the rich and famous are held up as the goal to which we should all work. So in light of this characterization, consider for a moment how the 21st century might look to you as a leader of a developing nation or even a petrostate, now with considerable new wealth but with no enlightenment tradition. Maybe your resentment at having been lacked multiple times by the West would motivate you to announce your arrival on the world stage by, let's say, hosting the Olympics the way Beijing did flamboyantly in 2008, or as Sochi did less effectively in 2014. Or maybe you would attempt to win an imaginary skyscraper sweep states, like the United Arab Emirates and China are doing, trying to outdo the West with its own iconic creation. Or if your resentment boiled over, at your fear of being left out, or fear of missing out, pardon me, I misspoke that, that's the acronym FOMO, or its corollary fear of being left out, the acronym FOBLO, maybe you would instead determine to fly airliners into high profile Western architecture like the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. 
In addition to what Malthus, Montesquieu, and Dostoevsky noticed happening in the world, each in their respective eras, Adam Smith, one of the founders of what's called political economics, denounced what he called the vile maxim of the merchant capitalist, namely, quote, all for ourselves and nothing for other people, end quote. Allow me to quote further and somewhat liberally from Scottish philosopher, writer, and satirist Thomas Carlyle, whose dates are 1795 to 1881. He has a rather entertaining essay called Jesuitism from a collection of essays called Latter-day Pamphlets, which was published in 1850, in which he propounds what he calls pig philosophy. So considering Thomas Carlyle is Scottish, if I had a good Scottish accent, I'd, I'd try it out for you, but I don't have such a thing. So I'm afraid if I tried it, I'd end up sounding more like Shrek. Here's the beginning of the quote. The votes of all creatures, it is understood at present, ought to be had that you may legislate for them with better insight. How can you govern a thing? say many, without first asking its vote, unless indeed you already chance to know its vote. And even something more, namely, what you are to think of its vote, what it wants by its vote, and still more important, what nature wants, which latter, at the end of the account, is the only thing that will be got. Big propositions, in a rough form, are somewhat as follows. He has a list of over a dozen, but I will abbreviate and provide only six. So number one, the universe, so far as same conjecture can go, is an immeasurable swine's trough, consisting of solid and liquid and other contrasts and kinds, especially consisting of attainable and unattainable, the latter in immensely greater quantities for most pigs. Number two, moral, evilly, moral evil is unattainability of pig's wash. Moral good, attainability of ditto. Number three, paradise, also called state of innocence, age of gold, and other names, was, according to pigs of weak judgment, unlimited attainability of pig's wash perfect fulfillment of one's wishes so that the pig's imagination could not outrun reality. A fable and an impossibility as pigs of sense now see. Number four, it is the mission of universal piggood and the duty of all pigs at all times to diminish the quantity of unattainable and increase that of attainable. All knowledge, device, and effort ought to be directed thither and thither only. Pig science, pig enthusiasm, and devotion have this one aim. It is the whole duty of pigs. Number nine, what is justice? Your own share of the general swine's trough, not any portion of my share. And finally, number ten, but what is my share? <laughs> ah, therein lies the grand difficulty upon which pig science, meditating this long while, can settle absolutely nothing. My share is on the whole whatever I can contrive to get without being hanged or sent to the hulks. For there are gibbets, treadmills, I need not tell you. End of quote. So this colorful formulation by Thomas Carlyle was among the widespread Western philosophies of the time, which regarded humans as mere creatures of appetite, having no nobler idea of well-being than the gratification of desire. Though these principles were enumerated 170 years ago, they describe the current state of capitalism in kind, if not in degree. Indeed, the corrupting nature of money harkens back to biblical times. Today, the second Gilded Era in the U.S., we've reached unprecedented levels of inequality. The lopsided numbers have been amply reported for more than a decade now. Still, 
so egregious has the inequality become that, according to Robert Frank in his book, Richistan, A Journey Through the American Wealth Boom and the Lives of the New Rich, the social conditions of the financial elite are so fundamentally different from the rest of us, it beggars imagination. Here I quote from his book. Today's rich had formed their own virtual country. They were, in fact, wealthier than most nations. By 2004, the richest 1% of Americans were earning about 1.35 trillion a year, greater than the total national incomes of France, Italy, or Canada. And with their huge numbers, they had built a self-contained world unto themselves, complete with their own healthcare systems, concierge doctors, travel networks, NetJet and destination clubs, separate economy, double-digit incomes and double-digit inflation, and language, as in, who's your household manager? They didn't just hire gardening crews, they hired personal arborists. The rich weren't just getting richer, they were becoming financial foreigners, creating their own country within a country, their own society within a society, their own economy within an economy. End of quote. Robert Frank, the book is called Richestan. So considering this book was published in the summer of 2008, just before the most recent financial crisis, and how inequality has only reasserted itself with a vengeance in the dozen years since, the mechanisms leading to absurd fortunes have only intensified. I've heard it said recently that you don't make a billion dollars, you take it. Although it's easy to characterize our shared dilemma as an us versus them competition, the truth is that most of us really want to become them. Gates, Jobs, Musk, Cuban, Oprah, Zuckerberg, Buffett, and Bezos, just to name a few of the richest Americans, represent aspirational models for the rest of us. Those of us on track to make fortunes are only really temporarily embarrassed millionaires, to paraphrase John Steinbeck. But sorry to break it to you, one million has lost its cachet and its power. Real wealth is now measured in the hundreds of millions, or even billions, or as they're called by the filthy rich nerds who took their revenge, a hunch, or a bill. Accordingly, most of us labor in service of the technocracy. We've been captured, and maybe even convinced, body and soul, to support and extend the technocracy, even though it doesn't reward us. The shrinking middle class treads water with stagnant wages since 1975 and diminishing prospects, while real capitalists loot the treasury after causing the 2008 <coughs> financial collapse, or corner markets and establish non-competitive monopolies our government refuses to regulate or break up. In his book, They Rule, The 1% Versus Democracy, published in 2014, Paul Street summarizes the effect of this ideological capture. Here I quote. Liberalism's update and repackaging of bourgeois individualist ideas for the corporate and mass consumerist mass media era is so omnipresent and repetitive across dominant corporate news, commercial and entertainment media, and the broader ideological and intellectual culture that it has become almost like the cultural air many millions of Americans breathe. Its messages have become so seemingly universal, natural, and commonsensical that they must have become practically invisible to the naked political eye and must be decoded and exposed for what they really are, vicious and historically specific capitalism-generated notions and sensibilities fed to the public 
through potent, corporate-dominated means and modes of thought and feeling control. End of quote. I mentioned earlier that the worst technocrats are those who weaponize information. Environmental and political activist George Monbiot stated in a YouTube video just last month that, quote, oligarchs have discovered the formula for persuading the poor to vote for the interests of the very rich, end of quote. <laughs> the formula is only a metaphor, but it functions like the Google, YouTube, Facebook, and Amazon algorithms that construct the search results and online <coughs> feeds we're also familiar with. In addition, because oligarchs own and run the TV networks, the magazines, newspapers, and think tanks that shape the public sphere, they are in a unique position to basically tell Americans what to think, especially if working class Americans are too busy or defeated with multiple jobs just to make ends meet that they lack time and energy for information gathering, independent thought, and consideration and synthesizing of competing narratives. News and public relation folks are sometimes called the chattering classes because they're perched on power lines like crows, noisily competing for control of conversational space. The chattering classes arguably includes educated people like me who talk about and debate politics, culture, and society. In contrast, working class journalist and author Joe Badgent called the punditry the catering class because they service the agenda of the plutocracy. They are courtiers to the powerful, often rewarded handsomely for their favorable opinions, and have been co-opted to perform their assigned scripts, not unlike pitchman Ronald Reagan in an earlier era. Irresistible as industrial capitalism and its bounties may be, resistance to the pull of modernity was evident from the start. If Voltaire was the head cheerleader for the bourgeoisie, Jean-Jacques Rousseau was its principal detractor. Any survey of history reveals resistance cropping up again and again and again, only to be suppressed by what has clearly become the paradigmatic example of modernity. A ruthless, exploitative, militaristic transfer of wealth and power upwards to a tiny class of oligarchs and plutocrats. German Romanticism and American Transcendentalism, occurring at opposite ends of the 19th century, both sought to restore a pastoral cultural orientation quickly being displaced by urbanism. The main political resistance of the 19th century was the Paris Commune in 1871, a radical socialist and revolutionary government that followed a century of political instability in France. The Commune was echoed a few decades later by the Bolshevik, Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, dating from 1917. Neither of these political experiments survived long before following victim to belligerent factions vying for authoritarian control. Another example of resistance is Marxism, which originates in the works of 19th century German philosophers Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. It's another example of resistance has and has demonstrated sustained influence in the marketplace of ideas for more than one and a half centuries. Wikipedia defines Marxism as, quote, a method of socioeconomic analysis that views class relations and social conflict using a materialist interpretation of historical development and a dialectical view of social transformation, end of quote. Or more succinctly, Marxism is a pointed critique of capitalism. The U.S. had its first major Marxist or socialist movement in the early 20th century, often associated with Socialist Party presidential candidate Eugene Debs. 
rising socialist, socialist fervor was quelled in the United States with enactment of the New Deal under FDR during the Great Depression of the 1930s, which had followed shortly after the 1929 financial collapse. According to some analyses, by adopting socialist reforms, FDR actually saved capitalism from itself. Still, the New Deal and post-war economic boom were not enough to forestall resistance, which reformed itself in the anti-establishment counterculture of the 1960s that repudiated materialism, opposed the U.S. war in Vietnam, and with its rejection of mainstream political engagement, exhorted people to turn on, tune out, and drop out, man. In response, the establishment came roaring back over the last four decades with Reaganism, the 1980s culture of greed, and the new Democrats under Bill Clinton, who pulled an FDR and saved capitalism by enacting the agenda of the opposition, except that the opposition this time wasn't socialism, it was republicanism. Two more market crashes proved insufficient to dislodge technocracy, but renewed resistance came in the form of the Occupy movement in 2011 and 12, and democratic socialism, now being championed by Bernie Sanders. In addition, in the wake of scientific consensus regarding climate change, the Green New Deal, Extinction Rebellion, and the Sunshine, or is it Sunrise Movement? I can't remember which. Sunrise. Sunrise Movement have all advocated adoption of anti-capitalist agendas to address existential threats to life and livelihood brought about by rapacious industrial activity. All these forms of resistance are mere citations of mine without careful explanation and should be familiar to just about anyone with a basic grasp of history. So let me cite instead a few other unfamiliar examples. Human Agenda, a 17-year-old organization that promotes democracy, equality, cooperation, kindness, and sustainability, argues that we are surrounded by capitalism, which is a global commodification of life. In particular, corporations are based on exploitation, financial institutions are based on speculation, and the electoral system in the U.S. is based on corruption, all of which are legal according to law, the U.S. Constitution, and the Supreme Court. Richard Hobbs, the executive director of Human Agenda, proposes alternative values in five parts. He believes that everyone should have, number one, time, opportunity, and duty to engage in care work. Two, time and resources to produce essential goods or services for, a so so for society at a living wage with reduced work hours. Number three, time and resources for lifelong learning with accurate information. Four, time and resources to engage in democratic participatory decision making. And number five, time and resources for self-actualization or socialized self-realization. Hobbes' emphasis on time and resources is important as the social safety net in the U.S. has been whittled down to nearly nothing. In a wealthy first world nation, according to our disgraceful ideology and priorities, there is no apparent floor U.S. citizens cannot sink below, as evidenced by homeless encampments in tent cities situated alongside some of the wealthiest districts in the nation. Yeah. Poverty and despair, in addition, take many forms in the U.S. Recent issues of Harper's Magazine, which I subscribe to, provide heartbreaking profiles of communities of people badly served by society. Here I quote um, a little from the beginning of each of two different profiles. A few miles north of San Francisco, off the coast of Sausalito, is Richardson Bay, 
a saltwater estuary where roughly 100 people live out of sight from the world. Known as anchor outs, they make their homes a quarter mile from the shore on abandoned and unseaworthy vessels doing their best with little or no money to survive. And the second article, the San Luis Valley in southern Colorado looks much as it did 100 or even 200 years ago. Living there, <coughs> it's hard not to picture oneself as a homesteader. The land is not free, but it's cheap, some of the cheapest in the United States. In many respects, a person could live here in this vast, empty space like the pioneers did on the Great Plains, except you'd have a truck instead of a mule and some solar panels, perhaps even a cell phone signal. The full articles tell the story of crushing poverty, despair, alienation, desperation, people that have given up because the U.S. has given up on them. These are basically people who are driven to the fringes. Examples of people driven to despair include the opioid crisis and rising rates of death by suicide and alcoholism. Incidences of these so-called diseases of despair are, according to Wikipedia, quote, high in the Appalachia region of the United States. The prevalence increased markedly during the first decades of the 21st century, especially among middle-aged and older working-class white Americans starting in 2010, followed by an increase in mortality for Hispanic Americans starting in 2011 and African Americans in 2014, end of quote. Some of you might have also heard of Camper Force, the loose collection of mostly retirees who live in RVs and eke out a living, traveling site to site periodically to staff regional Amazon fulfillment centers. It's low wage work and notoriously difficult physical and piecework requirements drive people out of the workforce. Ironically, Amazon itself celebrates camper fo force with some spin doctoring on its website, co-opting a decidedly desperate demographic for its own profit. From their website, let me quote, the Amazon camper force program brings together a community of enthusiastic RVers. As a camper force associate, you'll be able to choose from seasonal assignments in a variety of locations depending on your availability. End of quote. There's more at that website, by the way, if you want to investigate the irony of uh, Amazon cannibalizing its workforce. These last three examples may not be resistance to the technocracy or to capitalism per se. Rather, they're examples of the lengths people resort to just to survive in a society that essentially abandons them to their own awful fates. These gr groups used to be known as the precariat because their lives are so precarious. But new analyses suggest that a better term is the unnecessariat because technocratic refinements, inefficiency, and automation, plus the sheer amount of surplus labor available to corporations, make people, frankly, unnecessary. My final example comes from outside the United States. In France, the Yellow Vests have sustained what began as a demonstration against a proposed fuel tax, but have expanded their resistance to a variety of assaults on hard-won rights and labor benefits. The French government under President Emmanuel Macron has been attempting to dismantle those benefits, presumably as a result of austerity measures needing to be taken by the French government. The yellow vest itself turned out to be the perfect symbol for the movement because of its visibility, its ready availability, and its association with everyday blue collar workers. Many have wondered what a revitalized labor movement might look like in the United States. However, because the U.S. workforce 
and labor force has been so thoroughly co-opted, propagandized, or in fact forced into the technocracy. They lack the French tradition of active dissent, and there is little expectation that a renewed labor movement will take any root. The final example comes from Hungary, where a nativist movement called Turinism has become popular. Here I quote from an article called The Call of the Drums by Jacob Mikanowski from the August 2019 issue of Harper's Magazine. The great Kurultage, an event held annually outside the town of Bugak, Hungary, is billed as both the tribal assembly of the Hun Turkic nations and Europe's largest equestrian event. It features a variety of riders on horseback, some dressed as Huns, others as Parthian cavalrymen, Scythian archers, Magyar warriors, Sikos cowboys, and Bejar bandits. In total, there were representatives from 27 tribes, all members of the Hun Turkic fraternity. End of quote. I raise this example because it's based on an entirely invented mythology tracing lineage back to Attila the Hun. And it's established to create a sense of belonging among its members and its attendees. For Turinism, pillage and domination are the celebrated values, which have surprising consonance with capitalism, but are really throwbacks to barbarianism. Use of the term tribe is no accident, as many of us have been taught to regard ourselves as members of some agreed race, religion, or nationality, separated into in-groups and out-groups. It's misdirection and distraction from the technocrats, oligarchs, and plutocrats who are actually responsible for gobbling up the world's resources in a winners-take-all competition, leaving the rest of us in the lurch. Similar populist movements are springing up in other countries, and they share with Turinism a marked disconcern with history or reliance on truth and accuracy. Indeed, we in the United States have our own invented mythologies, disconnected from academic history and popularized by the punditry and politicians. These include notions of the U.S. being a God-fearing Christian nation, or for that matter, a citadel or beacon of freedom the world should admire and emulate. Similarly, the American West in the 19th century was not tamed, subdued, and civilized by settlers and pioneers, but was in fact the site of a genocide. The best contemporary examples of invented mythology are that, one, the U.S. is not, in fact, <coughs> a colonial empire, having functionally inverted its relationship with the former British Empire, and two, the U.S. is or can remain the world's sole economic and military superpower. Both of these suppositions are easily disproven. In conclusion, it's hard for some to understand how nerds good at capitalist enterprise and richly rewarded for their efforts would pile success upon success, at least in financial terms, to seek revenge on others. In short, when does too much become enough? From a purely capitalist perspective, a pathology according to many analyses, the question is a non-starter. It has no intrinsic meaning. Rather, the game, once commenced, has just one end, the utter destruction of one's competitors, just like the game of Monopoly taught us all as children. My survey recognizes some aspects of late-stage capitalism and various forms of resistance, including those who either can't or won't play the game anymore. That resistance or refusal has been beaten back successfully for now, but the end game draws near. I don't have a particular program or course of action to suggest or a political movement to support. Rather, 
what I've described is more nearly a diagnosis without a prognosis, a prescription, or a cure. Okay. Uh, Andy, you want to moderate for questions or you want to help well, solve for you? All right. No go camera. Please. I know no camera. Go ahead and ask your question. Wait, why isn't Andy moderating? Thank you. So, from my understanding, uh, out, please. I know. For my understanding, don't you think in the future, in the future, uh, like robots, you know, robots, yeah. you know, like people uh, robots. have robots, right? And they're pretty smart, right? Don't you think in the future people, people gonna be learn from the robots as well, like you know, like because technology, like whatever. So that's what my question. Don't you think robots gonna be improved and people will learn from robots in the future? <laughs> It's the robot's big, uh, big business. Yeah, the robots Thank you. Do okay, the question is whether we will benefit from the robots from the entrance of robotics into, yeah. I guess, the the workplace and Small into the system. whatever, like everywhere. anywhere in, in, in the our stores, cultural life. You know? Yeah. In the college. Um, in the Technology has its benefits, obviously, and it has its drawbacks. Um, Andrew Yang is the presidential candidate who's paid most attention to the coming uh, wave of industrial innovation leading to the unnecessary, as I named them before, people who are going to be thrown out of work because there's no need for them anymore. Can we learn from that, or can we benefit from that? I have a hard time picturing it. Okay, next question, please. All right, go ahead. How does your theory apply to climate change? Do you have any views of, I don't know, the technocracy, or what, explain what we could do, or, um, or and it seems like almost like you're, I don't know about the, technocracy kind of analyzes things. Um, I'm not sure who the driver is or behind it. It just kind of happens or um, I don't know. What do you think about climate change and how we could address it? That's a lengthy multi-part question. Uh, what's driving the technocracy is, uh, let's just start with that one first. It coalesced out of mercantilism several centuries ago, but once it was game on, then you found various actors willing to game the system, to treat it like a game and run it to its brutal end. And we're approaching that end, in my view. How this relates to climate change, it's interrelated because industrial activity is responsible for uh, putting us in a precarious situation with respect to the Earth's climatological systems, which threaten to kill off a substantial portion of the living Earth and perhaps extinct humanity itself. Do I have a solution? No, I don't. Okay, next. <laughs> Come on, we got to have more questions. Uh, Go ahead. All right, do you acknowledge that the Industrial Revolution caused the death rates to drop precipitously and life uh, lifespans to expand, which is what led to the massive population growth? People stopped dying. And there are multiple um, causative factors that extended life expectancy, uh, decreased infant mortality, and led to the population explosion. Definitely it coincided with the Industrial Revolution, scientific development, uh, widespread adoption of hygiene, especially in the, the birthing of children, the availability of antibiotics. All that definitely is one of, or, or form part of the bounties of the modern world. There's no doubt about that. I can't dispute that. I'm not sure what, what you want me to make of that, though. We're better off now than we were having subsistence, subsistence farms and, and prior to our... You went back to the origins of technocracy and we're, we're better off now than we were then. We 
do you want to live on a farm and the make standard your own of living is arguably better now than it is then this is Steven Pinker's argument in the enlightenment now and there's a lot of um, numbers and line with numbers to be brought to bear on that very idea however it's a short-term gain because it's gonna kill us in large numbers it's going to because the climate is going to shift and we're going to suffer famine and uh, financial collapse and ecological collapse from which it's unlikely that we can recover surely you don't want to live on your own subsistence farm and be hyper local and have no means of travel you're asking me for a trade-off but do i want to live richly miles. now so that others can die in the future well that's kind of what we've settled on for better or worse most of us don't make that choice um, proactively it's simply the world we've in, um, inherited okay um, I, I have an opinion about uh, modern medicine and uh, radi uh, radio radiological cures for various cancers and things like that and um, you know it's my opinion that uh, radiology as applied to medicine is good for individuals as uh, I can't think of her name as as she said it gives people longer life and so on but I think it's bad for the species and I wonder if you comment on that did everyone hear the question no, no I'm sorry. Uh, she's pointing to radiology having a beneficial effect in extending the lives of individual people, but having a, an ultimately uh, detrimental effect on the species. Is that correct? And she wanted me to opine on that. As I said in response to the previous question, there are clear trade-offs. Um, the extension of life, especially end of life, um, comes at a huge cost for most people. It ends in bankruptcy for a lot of people when they whittle away all their life savings in the last few months of life in order to breathe a few more breaths. Um, does it have a wider influence on the species as a whole? That I have a hard time assessing. I, I couldn't really say. It's just an opinion of mine. It was a question, and I, I failed to answer it. Mm -hmm. Did she say radiology or radiation? Radiology and radiation, they're interrelated. They're not precisely the same thing. Okay. Mr. Tra Charlie. I'll, I'll take this question. Mr. Uh, Travis. The fact that many, many people are taking a van and going into the wilds of, uh, of uh, places like... Um, I can't think of the state. California. No. Uh, Washington. North, North, North. Oregon. Oregon. Washington. Washington. Oregon. No. Wyoming. Yeah. But, but going into a, a northern state, into the wilds and um, having their own solar collectors and living off the grid, uh, isn't this an indication that a lot of people are throwing off the um, collectivist type thing of government and saying, hey, the hell with you, we're, we're going to live on our own without any of that. And what's more, uh, don't, do you want to talk? And what's more, uh, the, the, um, don't you think that the injections of socialism from the late 19th century on till today have caused the ills that we feel within a capitalist system. We don't really live in a capitalist system. Uh, so we have all kinds of government involvement. They tell us that we're free. Can I stop you there? You've asked two distinctly unrelated questions. <laughs> um, so the first question is, what about people who have gone back out into the wild to live off-grid. Um, I'm, I'm familiar with a variety of movements in that direction. Sometimes it's called rewilding. Um, I know that there's a 
movement towards what's called woofing, which is people going back to farms to learn how to grow food and manage herds of livestock, to regain knowledge of the natural world that we lost over a number of generations. People used to possess that information and know-how, no longer do. Um, I'm also aware of a, of a National Geographic show called Life Below Zero, if you've ever heard of that. I think it's all on the, on the web. It might be on some streaming channel, I'm not sure which. But it's about people who uh, have gone into the northern climes of Alaska to live completely isolated and wild, <coughs> catching their own um, game, feeding themselves, and only rarely returning to civilization in order to uh, restock or restore themselves. It's a very difficult life, as I understand it. But the, the psychological effects that they often report, the self-determination, the complete lack of structure in the day, the ability to control one's own fate, are extremely um, satisfying for those who do it. Your second question uh, was begging the question, hasn't socialism injected us with the very things that have made capitalism dissatisfactory. That's, that's begging the question, like, when did you last beat your wife? Uh, socialism is not responsible for the, the problems that plague capitalism. Capitalism has its own internal logic that leads to its own contradictions and its own failures. Socialism, especially the Marxist brand, is a pointed proceed aimed at capitalism and offers uh, a different way of organizing ourselves as a society so that we don't continue to funnel money up the hierarchy to the people at top who then game the system for their own benefit leaving everybody else behind. Chuck? Yeah, Bob, uh, in capitalist societies, they have an expression, I heard it's the same place you hear this expression, get out of here, you bum. And a bum is a person that's scorned because either they don't have a job or don't work steady. But according to you, bums are all right because they're rejecting, as you say, the material world as the ideal. If I'm correct. What's your question? <laughs> okay. Are you are bums positive elements in your society? Because they reject materialism. There are a lot of examples across cultures, across time, of folks who have rejected materialism and prefer to live as ascetics. Um, do I approve? Do I disapprove? I don't actually know. I have a hard time imagining it because I was born into a system of, of social organization where I'm expected to provide for myself and provide in some measure for others, but mostly for myself, because those others don't matter nearly as much as I do. So different strokes, different folks. I, I can't pass a judgment on somebody who wants to to check out and go do something else. A lot of people do it. Some are being forced to do it. You said the material world is the ideal. You have a question? Yeah, I got a question. Um, and I said that is. Uh, a lot of, at the Wannsee conference in Germany in 1942, a lot of the, half of the people there, half of the Nazis there, when they decided on the final solution, had PhDs. So do you think education is the answer for all the world's problems? I think he's trying to phrase it, does that? Does yeah, you, you've already answered your own question. 
<laughs> I guess not. You, you, you boxed me in, basically. So thanks for that. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> no, of course, education is not a panacea for all the things that hurt us and harm us. Okay. Uh, there's, I would never suggest such a thing. Uh, in fact, as I say at the beginning of my speech here, it's specifically the nerds among us, the ones who go to school and develop their intellects and their skills, who often become the, the technocrats serving the technocracy. So within a, a certain frame of thinking, instrumental logic rules and anything that becomes an impediment is something to be waved away or discarded. So you, you were saying that um, intellectuals are the smart people and people who work with their hands aren't so smart? Is that what you were saying? No, I didn't say that at all. Oh, I thought that's what you said. You have to recognize that there's a, 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 a separation between the working classes and, and the, the technocrats. And I, and I drew some of those distinctions. You're, you're either being willfully uh, contrarian or you're just not following the speech. Go ahead. I feel quite inundated by many views. I was wondering if you could summarize your own main thesis without quoting Montesquieu. Montesquieu. The thesis is in the title. Nerds among us, including many of us, have been drawn into uh, the technocracy and supported partly out of a desire for revenge, out of a desire for um, staking our own successes as uh, antidote to the humiliations we feel growing up early in life or even later in life, such as the example I cited with Donald Trump being humiliated at the, the nerd prom. That's the, that's the thesis in short. Um, I'm glad that you announced that thesis because I'm wondering if that is specifically an American thesis or does it apply to areas like India and Japan where being an engineer is highly valued? And you know, being a jock is less important. I can't speak for other cultures. I'm thoroughly American. I've traveled abroad, but I don't have enough uh, intimate knowledge and, and awareness of other cultures to, to say. However, based on what I read, especially Pankaj Mishra's book, The Age of Anxiety, um, there's a great deal of desire among people from other regions of the world to emulate the Western model, which is in the more recent era, the American model. Any more questions? Yes. Um, yeah, I was reading on what is technocracy in Wikipedia and it seemed to talk about the this movement in the 30s or um, you know it's kind of re related to economics and um, uh, that is not as popular like maybe the scientists should influence the politicians or um, but what they talk about the smooth Harley you know the tariffs so I was wondering, I mean, do you have any opinion about, um, I hadn't really looked at tariffs and Trump's tariffs policies but, and what caused the depression, but they say a lot of people think that the high tariffs caused the depression and coming to reasonable tariffs, um, generally accepted theory uh, kind of stop the depression, the balance of trade. So have you thought of applying your your theories to economic, um, being an advisor to Trump, <laughs> or the president? So, I mean, do you see that there's some application in that regard, or this analysis? 
I did not consult Wikipedia or any other source when I adopted the term technocracy. Okay. I'm aware of, um, I actually read Neil Postman's book, Technopoly, written back in the 90s, that describes much of what I'm describing as well. Uh, you heard me use the phrase social organization again and again and again, and that's what it is. It's a, it's a style of social organization uh, based on techniques, this technocracy, and one of those techniques is, is the technology of <coughs> capitalism. Do I know enough about economics to consider myself in an advisory position to anyone? No, not really. Would Donald Trump accept my economic uh, theories? I don't think he accepts anybody's economic theories. <laughs> well, I, I think he has these ne neoliberal monetarists uh, from Fox News kind of, you know, driving his... Neoliberal yeah. wouldn't be for tariffs. Neoliberals uh, aren't for tariffs. Well, they are putting them in, whatever they're but doing. But that's yeah. not a neoliberal well, position. Right. Okay. Yeah. One or two more yeah. questions and we'll go to rebuttals. Mm -hmm. There's a question over here. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Yeah, there's right a now, uh, antibiotics... Uh, yeah, I facing know increased resistance. All right. Various uh, drugs right. are developing the ability to resist antibiotics. How long before the uh, bugs neutralize the antibiotics? That's unpredictable. How long before uh, the bugs neutralize the viruses antibiotics. and bacteria mutate beyond our pos or our ability to control them? Is your question? I'm I'm repeating your question so that everybody can hear it. Sure. Um, I am a doctor, but I am not a physician. <laughs> I'm suspicious, and especially not an epidemiologist. I don't work for the Centers of Disease Control. The the latest news about the coronavirus falls way outside of my field of expertise. Uh, so, what do I know? I'm not sure why you're asking me this question. But I will observe that it's been 102 years since we had the latest pandemic, the Spanish flu that killed roughly a third of the European population. We've held all that back, including SARS and birds flu and swine flu and Ebola. We've held all that back satisfactorily. Coronavirus might be the one that bursts through. I'm not sure. Stay tuned. Well, it's that the antibiotics are getting weaker, or the bugs are getting stronger. Yes, it's it's basically run its course, and now it'll it'll go off course. It's, it's not just one disease, but it's a number of different kinds of bugs that are developing this resistance. I agree with you. Okay. What is your PhD in? I have a doctor of musical arts. I'm a musician. What do you wow. play? Music? I'm a trombonist. And I play piano. Uh, and I'm a musician. I what, yeah. what is it about Neil Postman's technopoly that you that you find compelling? I haven't read it in more than a decade. I can't comment on it. But it just makes sense anymore. to you. Yes. Right. Yeah. It's, He's a compelling uh, uh, writer and cultural critic. Okay, any more questions? Yeah. All right, Charlie. Yeah, you say the rich is in their own country. And uh, people stand one fool at a time, Dan. All right, sorry. Uh, the rich have formed their own country, but given social stratification, doesn't each of uh, the levels of the social society, in essence, have its own culture and its own country? Why are the roots segregated in this regard? I don't understand that. They self-segregate. They should live on Addison and Sacramento. They have their own norms and morals. We usually divide socioeconomics into 
quintiles, top quintile, second on down to the fifth. Um, so the bottom middle class might occupy the middle ones and the underclass, the bottom one, and the, the rich, the top one, right? So you're, you're asking, why do they separate from each other? Well, birds of a feather flock together. That's a basic uh, sociological observation embodied in an aphorism. Um, more importantly, because immense wealth confers upon those who possess it unusual power, influence, and options not as well enjoyed by the rest of the population, they have a unique uh, sensibility unto themselves. They tend to silo themselves into locations like the Upper East Side of Manhattan or Martha's Vineyard where the Obamas are retreating to or Jackson Hole or Davos, Switzerland or other places where they all collect together to be amongst themselves. Why do they do that? I don't know exactly, but it's an observable phenomenon. Okay. Last question. Poor people collect in bad neighborhoods. Right. Well, that's it. Um, excluding the severity of poverty, yeah. is, there, is there a poverty level at which point you think a revolution might be justified? All right, thanks. <laughs> All right. The question was excluding abject poverty. I'm not sure why you want to exclude that. Is there a level at which rebellion or or revolution becomes necessary? Was that or inevitable? Was that the word? Justifiable. Justifiable. That's a that's a judgment call. Obviously. And so far, the French are much closer to making that judgment call than we are. We seem to be able in the United States to stomach just about anything thrown at us because we feel powerless, disempowered, and uh, optionless. The French, on the other hand, are taking to the streets. So, by the way, are the Hong Kong natives. They're taking to the streets, both of them in rather sustained fashion to disrupt their respective um, business as usual operations because they feel their cause is justified. <clears throat> I will repeat something that I heard in a, in a discussion recently, um, some pundit or some talking head talking to another pundit or talking head, that by some measure, I can't remember what the organization was, um, I think it was in answer to the question, don't we look better now than we did 300 years ago? Uh, so, the issue became, the level of poverty is defined by this organization, I can't remember the name of it, uh, as living on the equivalent of $1.80 per day. Which is an absurdly low amount because that has to cover food, clothing, housing, everything, and it's just impossible. Because if, you, if you're generous, let's bump it up to $1,000 a year, which is in excess of 180 a day. You can't live on that. That's not a reasonable number. <clears throat> For the sake of argument in this discussion, they bumped the number up to $10 a day. And if you multiply that, then you're talking about roughly, what, $35,000 a year? $3,500. $3,500. Pardon me, I'm doing my math wrong. That condition describes roughly half of the population of the planet today. So, in answer to the question, are we better off now than we were 300 years ago, you'd probably have to conclude some of us are. But most of us aren't. Does that justify revolution or rebellion or or replacement of the system and the spreading of the spoils of of all of our labor? You can draw your own conclusion. Okay. Let's go to re Andy. Are you ready to help us on the rebuttals? Let's thank our speaker. Yeah. Very good.
anyone you want to rebut tonight, please raise your hand. All right, Andy, we'll let you go. You're going to get a rebut, Charlie? Yes, he is. One, two, it goes without saying. Right? Three, how, over uh -huh. here, how many? Um, All right. Go about the five minutes, Andy, you think? You, Andy. All right, about five minutes apiece. All right, we have an open podium. Let's get to it. You don't mind timing, right, Andy? Thank you. Um, this is going to be a very silly comment. I bought chopsticks at Sir La Table for about $12 for six um, pairs of chopsticks. And my granddaughter wanted me to give her chopsticks for her for a gift. So Sir La Table wasn't a, didn't have any at the time. And I went to 900 North Michigan because that's where they said Sir La Table was moving to. Well, they hadn't opened their shop yet. But there was another kitchen shop at 900 North Michigan. So I went there and told them I wanted to get some chopsticks. And the only pair of chopsticks they had there, I mean the cheapest pair, was $30 for one pair of chopsticks. Uh, and I just, I was so out of place in that building at 900 North Michigan. I've never forgotten the address. Uh -huh. And if you really want to see obscene wealth and how to spend it, I recommend that you go into that building, walk up and down the floors and through the shops, and you will understand your position in life. Who's <laughs> next? You can buy a pair of chopsticks now on Amazon for five ninety five. Steal some from the Chinese restaurant. <laughs> All right, Dan. All right. So the speaker had some good ideas. One good idea was a genocide in the West from 1800 to 1890. There's another thing that the America invented, and that was slavery which was from 1619 to about 1863. And slavery was very American. And when the Nazis were figuring out uh, laws for the Jews in Germany, they looked to America, the South, for some ideas to make laws. And they found laws in the Mississippi, Alabama, were were more strict, too, too mean for their laws. So they made nicer laws for the Jews. <laughs> like Jews can't sit in the front of class. Jews can't, Jews have to give all their books yeah, to the Nazis. And they have to burn all the books, Charlie. You don't like what I'm saying, Charlie? I'm talking Bob. Oh, OK. Anyway, so. Uh, America has done a lot of great things. And as far as the slavery, everybody here has benefited from slavery. I've benefited from slavery. And so I think reparations are a good idea I've for slavery. Owned, I've never owned a slave and these people never really were slaves. America was built by slavery. I've never owned a slave. Mazel tov. I never owned a slave they either. Never never One bull at a time, Charlie. Two or three. On what basis do you think? Hey, sure. No, On what basis? Man. Called history. Ah, oh, get out of here. Okay, I'll go. The Romanovs owe me, uh... The Come on, no heckling, please. Let's keep it civil. Thank you. Finish up, Dan. Okay, so... so take your time. That's my idea. Have a nice day. Thank you. And as far as, as, far as protesting, every, every week, down at Trump Tower, you can protest. I did Doctor, Doctor Bob, Doctor Robert. Sorry, uh, you can protest all you want every week. They protest uh, fascist, fascist Trump. But as far as fascist Trump, Trump was, is supported by many PhDs. Obama was supported by many PhDs. Hitler was supported by many PhDs. 
So what do you think of that? Have a nice day. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I just thought I'd follow up with um, a dance comment, you know, because I agree that uh, like economics, you know, I've told y'all before, um, my name's Ellen Corley, but I grew up with a neoliberal libertarian stepfather who was friends with Milton Friedman and Ayn Rand and Alan Greenspan and basically brainwashed me in this theory of free market and trust that, um, you know, the let the bankers rule uh, without any regulations and it will come trickling down just like Reagan and, uh, and it, the, I had to kind of observe and learn by observation that uh, that that was a big lie, and um, you know the. But it's big lies, as Hitler or Eichmann, whoever said, um, you know, do have a way of. Uh, they're easier to get away with, especially if you control the media, and um, the education. I mean, it's a totalitarian government. And, we think that we're free. That's what's kind of concerning is, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm 64, so I went to school in the 70s and looked, studied things in the 80s. And, um, you know, we've really given this deregulation, Reaganomics, Nixon, Goldwater, conscience of a conservative. Uh, we, we've tested it, you know, we gave them a chance and look what we've gotten to, you know, at the, it didn't trickle down, the, that's science, I, the, my favorite philosophy of education, Dewey said, what is science, if you want to, you know, think about what is your philosophy, what is your philosophy of science, and uh, mine is, it's, Ayn Rand's is objectivism, which is make us all objects and, you know, kill us or something, right, versus subjective, treat us all to be able to look at the world scientifically, critically, you know, and then make educated opinions about who to vote for, uh, right? Um, and boy, it's very concerning that I tried to run for mayor and office and a, a president, whoever, I, I put in my application for chief of police this week, you know, but, um, right? <laughs> Boy, just getting the getting my video essay um, on the disc was the hardest part. But uh, I did want to. I'm gonna then try to sue them, you know, for unequal, you know, access opportunity if if they do run. And I think really what they need is if you look at the way they hire police, you wonder what's driving police brutality and. Um, really Ku Klux Klan and all our, uh, you know, real problems, uh, police state is um, partly the way they only hire men under 35 who've had military experience killing people and, you know, are used to the code of silence and, and you know, they kind of select out the science, you know, the whistleblowers and only hire the ones who know how to keep their mouths shut and not be rats, right? Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, but we do have to take them on, you know. Um, I, I was telling a judge that today. We went to a, a very good, um, a, the 49th Ward, 49th <coughs> Met, um, a very good political organization in uh, Rogers Park. It's a good model for what is needed all across, but they had, they were talking about the consent decree. and. Um, you know, it's great to see citizens like this coming together. With they, I'm going to try to get them to be a speaker here. And they, they had got together and filed the class action lawsuit um, that got the consent decree. Uh, now a year later, she admitted that um, the professor at Northwestern who was involved with this, this 49 net... Network 49. Network 49, thank you. Dot, yeah. um, great group. Uh, they, um, she said that, uh, you know, they, nothing has come of it. It's been a year now, um, but at least they're trying. She doesn't predict that they'll even try for 10 more years. I, uh, having been researching this, I, um, I, I want to 
you know, it's great to hear people at least trying, but uh, if you look at the history, I recently read the history of the FOP, um, that their whole thing was to fight this Weckersham report, you know, um, I mean, they've been organizing and getting away with that since the uh, 40s or something like that. Um, and their main thing was to not, was to get a pension, not just Social Security. You know, it, it's just, they, they, we need equal groups, right? You know, teachers union versus police union, you know, and uh, we all need to be treated equally, uh, so. Go ahead, David. Uh, just as an aside, I don't know where Dan gets the idea that uh, America invented slavery. <laughs> slavery goes all the way back to the Bible days. And what's more, yeah. England was big on slavery. Yeah, they were getting out there. of it right around the time that we were getting in it. Right. And uh, I'll bet almost yeah, that's a hello. I'll bet almost nobody here knows that uh, England also had people other than <coughs> black people involved in slavery. Sure. For instance, the Irish were yeah. taken from the seas and so forth and sold, bought and sold as slaves. And uh, an Irishman was worth something like two or three times what a black man was worth. So, uh, uh, which is probably another one of the reasons why the Irish have such a heavy grudge against the English, uh, or I should say against England. In any event, uh, America certainly did not invent slavery. It's been with us a long, long time. Uh, as far as um, I said earlier, injections of uh, socialism, and I was refuted on that pretty drastically. The fact is that uh, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, in the late 19th century, I think it was, uh, started with his trust busting. And if, if that wasn't an injection of socialism, I don't know what was, although that came out, did not come out of the East, it came right out of America. Nevertheless, trust busting was very much a socialist idea. Uh, bringing in unions uh, in the 1930s was very socialistic and uh, government supported the unions. Uh, a few years before that, Henry, Henry Ford had uh, doubled the wage, uh, and um, it was received very nicely. But uh, later on down the road, uh, the unions took hold, and the government backed the unions. Now, this, there must have been people of a socialist ideology in the government who, who uh, pushed for, for, uh, for the, the uh, unions. Uh, there have been a great many uh, attempts at injections of socialism into our capitalist society. Thank you. All right. I'm going next. Okay. Don't you say the all the problems. Child labor socialist. Frankly, I don't get it. Why can't we really see that we're living in a golden age? We have fallen upon evil times. Politics is corrupt. And the social fabric is Frank. Who said that? Donald Trump or Bernie Sanders? Nigel Faraki or Marie Le Pen? It's difficult to keep track. They sound so alike. The populists of the left and the right. Everything is also. So bring on the scapegoats and the knights on the white horses. The problem is, is that 
If you look at 1828, when the magazine The Spectator was first published, most people in Britain then lived in what is now regarded as extreme poverty. Life was nasty. People still threw their waste out of the window. British, corpses were still to play on giblets. And short, 30 years on average, was a lifespan. But even then, things have been improving. In 1711, People existed on average a few more calories than an average child gets today in sub-African Saharan Africa. Karl Marx thought capitalism would inevitably be made the rich richer and the poor poorer. By the time Marx died, however, the average Englishman was three times richer than in his birth 65 years earlier. Never before had the population experienced anything like it. Fast forward to 1981. Then, almost 9 in 10 Chinese live in extreme poverty. Now, 1 in 10 do. Then, just half the world's population had access to safe drinking water. Now, 91% do. On average, this means that 285,000 more people have gained access to safe water every day for the past 25 years. Global trade has led to an expansion of wealth on a magnitude which is hard to comprehend. During the 25 years since the end of the Cold War, global economic wealth, or GDP per capita, has increased almost as much as it did during the preceding 25,000 years. It is no coincidence that such growth has occurred alongside the massive expansion of rule by the people for the people. A quarter of a century ago, barely half the world's countries lived in democracies. Now, almost two-thirds are. To say that freedom is still on a march is still an understatement. Part of our problem is one of our success. As we get richer, our tolerance for global poverty diminishes. We get angrier about injustices. Charities quite likely wish to raise funds, so they know our attention to the plight of the world's poorest. But since the Cold War ended, extreme poverty has decreased from 37% to 9.6% in single digits for the first time in history. This has not happened through the destruction of the Western middle class. Times have been rough since the financial crisis. Yet for all the talk of Americans left behind by globalization, median income for low and middle class U.S. households has increased by more than 30% since 1970. And this excludes all the things you can't put a price on, such as advances in medicine, an extra 10 years of life expectancy, the internet, mass entertainment, and cleaner air or water. This has been the result of trade, global capitalism, and uh, the uh, free trade regime that we currently have in place. My problem is it's a very fragile type of thing and can be doomed at any given point. All it will take is a stopping of the cooperation between countries, perhaps maybe a tariff or as people get a little bit more territorial in their expansions, we can see a result and back to uh, the earlier ages. It's happened before. Look at the fall of the Roman Empire. Look at the fall of many empires when decadence gets a little bit out of control. But even then, um, every generation has their things. The central historian Arthur Friedman observed that virtually every culture, past or present, has believed that men and women are not up to the standards of their parents or forebearers. It is not a coincidence that the Western world is experiencing this great wave of pessimism at the moment the baby boom generation is retiring. So what do we say to the words at the start of this article about how we have fallen upon evil times? It wasn't Trump. It wasn't Farage. A century ago, an American professor found words of a similar type found inscribed on a stone in the Museum of Constantinople. He dated them to ancient Chaldea of 3800 BC. The point of the matter is if you look at the data and you look at the way we are living today, we are much, much better off. Oh, yeah. The world is starting to finally cure those problems of injustices of things along these lines and that's not to say that we're not capable of going back because look every again socialism has its uh, 
anyway, I'll, I'll stop here. I think I made my point. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. The article was from Johan Norberg in The Spectator. It was published in uh, August 19, 2016. I paraphrased a lot of it for, due to the brevity of the rebuttal. It's in The Spectator. It's in The Spectator, uh, August 19, 2016, by Johan Norberg. Who's next on the rebuttal? Yeah. Uh, all right. Yeah. Robert, great talk. Enjoyed it. Hope to have you back here soon. And you. Soon again. I don't know if anybody can hear me. I guess you can hear me. Yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, several comments. I'll comment first on, on what's that? Yeah, I'll comment on what, what Tim said, that uh, we're better off than we were. The question, the question is why? Is it strictly... An economic system, political system, yes, these, these uh, are part of the reasons that we have a very high standard of living now uh, in this country. But there are other factors as well. Technological advance, uh, which is not entirely separate from politics and economics, but these this plays a big role. And also accumulated One at a time, Charlie! Uh, uh, plays, plays a role uh, as well. In other words, uh, we build highways, we build uh, uh, airports and dams and, and other infrastructure, and, and we can build on that. Sometimes we have to rebuild it, but nonetheless, uh, some of it maintains and goes on to the next generation. Uh, I also want to comment, uh, uh, well, also regarding this, most countries, as far as socialism and uh, capitalism, uh, there are many, most countries are amalgams. Most countries uh, have systems which are in part socialist and in part capitalist. Certainly that's the case here. And there are differing degrees and differing systems work uh, better at different times in different places. And we, we need to see what works best uh, over, the, over the long haul. I know that I'll have arguments with some of my right-wing friends about an issue with, and after it goes for a little while, they'll say, well, you're nothing but a socialist. <laughs> and, and I'll say, well, yes, yes, in part I am a socialist. Uh, yeah, but so are you. And they go, oh. and I say, well, what about roads? What about schools? What about police departments? Et cetera, et cetera. So we're all amalgams. The best uh, shorthand way of looking at this, I think, is to look at the portion of the GDP which is uh, generated uh, or used by the government. And if you look at the more socialist countries, uh, uh, it's a higher percentage and then a lower percentage. I don't know what the percentages are today for the US. And we're toward the low end. I think Japan's a little lower and a few others. But uh, we're moving up. And uh, there's kind of a consensus now, I think, that we should be moving a little bit to the left in this way. But uh, uh, all of these things, you, you know, just have to see over time uh, how it works out. So our, our, our lives are products of all of these approaches and all of these ideas. Uh, the great in, in, uh, quality, which uh, Dr. Holland referred to, I went to a lecture yesterday, a uh, University of California professor and a University of Chicago professor discussed the whole issue. Uh, the California professor thinks we should be getting the high marginal income tax rate up to 60 or 70 percent, and we should definitely have uh, a wealth tax or a net worth tax. Uh, this is an idea. We probably won't have a net worth tax or a wealth tax for a while, but serious politicians are starting to talk about it, so it probably will come, and it's, it's uh, something we need. Uh, the, the conservative professor says, well, now you really don't want take, uh, let's say, on a, on a one-time initial tax, you don't want to take 10% uh, uh, of Jeff Bezos' stock in, in uh, uh, Amazon away from him. I mean, and that'll work out to actually 20%. Uh, and then, because of the fact that he'll have to sell all that stock, the stock prices will go down. That means he'll be having to, to, to uh, pay taxes of 25% of his stock in Amazon. You don't want that, do you? <laughs> Two-thirds of the people in the audience were going, yes, 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 we do. And so there's a, there's a sympathy for this now, I think, that is, is developing in this country. A couple of other quick comments. Um, 
just because certain educated people do bad things, which uh, Dan pointed out, uh, and some other people pointed out, uh, some some people who were educated work for for corporations and, and political parties and other uh, things that we don't like. That doesn't mean that education is a bad thing, that educated people are a bad thing. I think the more people know, the more they're educated, however they do it, whether it be going to a major university or a college or complexes, any knowledge you can come by helps all of us. Uh, and regarding revolutions, there was some talk about revolution here. Uh, revolutions are thought of as being started by the oppressed, by the people at the bottom. Generally speaking, this is not so. Most of the major revolutions of history uh, have been started and carried on by the middle classes, or in many cases, even uh, the upper classes. Thank you. All right, next. Charlie, I know you got something out of you there. All right. Let's get up there. Speak yeah, your piece. Charlie, come on. All right. Let's begin by uh, thanking Robert Holland for a nice essay covering a multitude of topics here. I really don't have much to contribute. Uh, there was brief mention of robots. Uh, there's the, something floating around the labor management field that uh, there's an assertion that more positions were lost uh, to robots than jobs lost to companies moving overseas. Uh, I don't believe that's accurate, but there's a number of people who are advancing that idea. I think the, gen the first generation of robots are doing pretty, pretty primitive stuff assembly line type activities, uh, they're not going to go anywhere. Dan, um, reparations is another term, it's called status quo ante, and it's a legal term, meaning that you will be made whole, and it's used in settlements, and you have to establish, you literally have to establish how much you lost, you lost, and how much you're entitled to by the other party. But it doesn't cross generations. No, it does not. If you go back, now you mentioned history. If you go back in history, can I, I can, do you realize how many ethnic groups have undergone some sort of dislocation due to another controlling force or party? Yeah, I, I, you know, I was thinking, yeah, I think my grand, I'm owed a certain amount of money by the owners of the Peabody Coal Company that worked my grandfather's pretty assiduously and didn't pay them adequately. So maybe I should go back to the anthracite fields of Pennsylvania and submit a claim. But he got paid. Maybe I should submit a claim and maybe go back should. a little further and submit a claim to Russia. Vladimir Putin because my family was mistreated by the Tsar. <laughs> and maybe we should go back a little further. You mentioned Peter the Great. I probably could find something that took place regarding the Poidokuses and Mother Russia's <laughs> at that time too. Now the thing I want to get to is uh, the regarding the rich and their social stratification and there are different ways of assessing the levels. I actually had a girlfriend and got to learn, amazingly enough, how the lowest strata operated. The ins and outs, and they had their own, their own operations here. Now, the rich come to mind. As a matter of fact, one of the things that's amazing, if you, if you watch a lot of films and comedy things, you have people from the lower strata do performing jobs for the highest, like Laurel and Hardy will, will get jobs working for rich people. Uh, the Three Stooges go to a dinner with rich people. Something like this is when they mix the, the stratus together that we find some sources of amusement. But nevertheless, uh, there are different cultures. Uh, and he was in reference there that the rich have formed their own country. 
I'm serious. I was amazed. I didn't realize the, the lower strata had the survival skills that they do. And they had their own uh, knowledge and, and networking, information networks uh, regarding, let's say the laws passed, remember the law was passed on requiring automobile insurance. And the first thing they knew was yeah. how to bypass that or where to go or something like this. Or they knew what to ask of the social workers, what they were entitled to and things like that. So there is a little culture there of each of them and they have operated it. A lot of us don't realize that, but yeah. And yeah, in the 30s it was popular in the, in the Hollywood scene uh, to uh, uh, highlight the aristocracy of the United States of America. And it still is home to the rich and famous. People aren't very much interested in the lives of the poor people and indolent bums and whatnot. Anyhow, Bob, thank you very much. And hope to hear from you again with another interesting uh, summary of our culture. Thank you. All right. Andy. All right. I was going to talk about socialism. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes the risk gets very get what? greedy. Well, greedy. I didn't know that. Greed is good. Bob, and make a few comments that uh, yeah. anybody else might have. Uh, I'll try to fill in some gaps. We're almost uh, done. This is the last one. Uh, Albert Einstein, one of his famous quotes was... Uh, All right, let's, uh, Andy, hold off. Let's hey, let let's let our speaker there. speak, please. Hey, I'm not saying a word. He's well, uh, can you guys move to the outside? All right, let's let's I mean, go back. Can't, nobody can hear a speaker with that kind of noise yeah. going on. Yeah. Okay, Andy, continue. Okay, we'll give it another shot. One of my favorite quotes is from Albert Einstein. He said, the human race is in a race between education and extinction. And I'm not sure which side is winning. Well, now we know which side is winning. The forces of extinction are closing in on us. We're, we're in World War III now. It's not a nuclear war. It's a war with Mother Nature. That These articles appear in the last two days summarizing how humanity is losing the war and being forced off the land by fire flood, hurricanes, tsunami, tornadoes, um, torrential rain, uh, where people are flooding in houses on higher ground where they thought it was impossible to flood. Uh, a, a group of mayors, they had the annual mayor's meeting at convention, and one of the mayors, I forget which one now, she was talking about her city was getting four, four, four days of rain, and she was going to stay in her house because she was up in an area where it just was impossible to flood. Well, she's on, on the second day of rain, her house started to flood, and she thought she would get back into it in a day or two after the rain subsided. Didn't get back there for a year. It was a total disaster. These kinds of things are just happening all over the world. And in this last week, along with uh, the meeting in Davos, Switzerland, and the rich people, uh, the climate scientists have published another global summary saying that we have 10 years tops to get off 80% of fossil fuel. They're not talking about cutting down 20 or 30% and maybe getting there half by 2050. Those were all uh, rosy estimates put out by the fossil fuel industries that are, are run by billionaire predators. We, we need to thank uh, Donald Trump and Mitch McConnell and some of the other Republican speakers of this last week because they are giving us the best demonstration I've seen in my lifetime of what intellectual prostitution looks like. <laughs> they're paid to stand there and lie to us. And they're paid to lie into the camera to tell lies to a group of people who know these are bald-faced lies. It's just one huge charade. And uh, we're, we're waiting to see if Mr. McConnell is actually going to uh, allow the Republicans to make a kangaroo court out of it after they all swore an oath to protect the Constitution. Are, are we interrupting your uh, exit, David? I'm sorry, what? I, I just wondered if I should take a break until you're finished up. Oh, you go right ahead. Okay. <laughs> For those of you that weren't aware, 
Uh, are, are, is everybody here aware of what happened in Flint, Michigan, with the lead and the poison in the water? Most people heard about that. Yes. 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 Trump just recently, uh, with executive orders, they've gotten rid of the regulations that will allow the corporations to just produce of Flint, Michigan everywhere. They're getting rid of all clean air, clean water, any regulations that would slow down the profits of corporations who don't make quite as much profits because they can't dump their excess toxic waste from the production, whatever it is, into the air, water, ground, streams, buried underground. Uh, it, you know, it's, we're looking at a total disaster. That's not true. Uh, that is true. It is absolutely true, and you quoted off a right-wing site, but I won't even uh, you know, uh, rebut that. Uh, <laughs> you're, you're wrong. Okay, just This is what I was talking about. The people are, 20% of this population, Mike Pence, the Vice President, Mike Pompeo, uh, and several other people <laughs> come from the 20% of Americans who are looking forward to the rapture. Mike Pence has a Bible open on his desk, and he consults the Bible during the day to do his governmental job. They're, they're looking forward to going to heaven in the rapture just before the first bomb hits, and we'll get a whole new planet when Jesus returns. That shit was insane 35 years ago, 40 years ago, in Reagan's time, and it's just as insane now. And if we sit back and allow that kind of thinking, to uh, run our government, then it's a prescription for disaster. People should be, uh, uh, people have a right to have their own religious beliefs, whatever it is, as long as those beliefs aren't used to, you being used to spread disease, death, and destruction all over the world to people that don't share those religious beliefs. Mm -hmm. John McMurtry, a Canadian, Canadian author, published a book in 1997 called the cancer stage of capitalism. He said unregulated capitalism will allow billionaires to get bigger and bigger and they'll get big like sharks and just eat everything in sight and yeah. destroy a country. And yeah. that's exactly yeah. what we are seeing. We're like living a shark. in it. And people that deny that are living in a bubble of Fox News generated mythology. You know, the idea that capitalism has brought us all these great Capitalism uh, grew to a certain point, but now we have to realize that it's killing the country. Unregulated capitalism is killing the planet. Other countries are coming to the same conclusion. We have to regulate it and move forward. And as a lot of these articles in the last week point out, we have, we're in World War III already. The United States, I mean, the, the, the environment, the global environment is waging war on us, and we're losing. If we don't mount a World War II type four or five year mobilization like what we did in 1941. The factories stopped making cars. They cranked one factory in Michigan made more bombers in four years than the Germ Germany produced in all of the war. They, they, they stopped making cars, all kinds of things. They made bombers, tanks. Industry tooled up and they, people took a time out for just four years and solved the problem. And they're saying that for the same amount of investment, that can be done again. Solar, high efficiency, wind, water, uh, all the technology is much simpler than, than making bombers and submarines to address the climate change. But we have to do something about the Republican, I shouldn't say Republican, they're not Republicans. They're criminals masquerading as Republicans are running our government. We have criminals masquerading as our elected officials, and if we don't do something, we're lost. America's gone. And that's where it is. So, thank you much. And uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. President, our, 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 well, uh, for those of you that didn't know it, Bernie Sanders has got a commanding lead in the polls now. Yeah. Yes. They have Joe Biden or anybody else in Iowa and New Hampshire. The new polls Time came out last Trump. night. Yes. So they can't keep force feeding us Joe Biden anymore because it's just not flying. Yep. Yep. All right. All right. Final, 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 final rebuttal. Let's go, Mr. Holland. I hope you have some. Well, thank you for indulging me. Thank you for your questions. Uh, I'm not sure that many of the questions really engaged the presentation that we gave. Rather, they were questions of your own devices and your own interests. And I suppose that's okay, but I, I'm not often uh, overwhelmed with questions that aren't about the topic of my speech. So I have to keep it out. I can't. I'm also a little surprised how 
willingly and how liberally people lob the Nazis and Hitler into their questions and their, and their rebuttals. There's a rule about that, how it skews the discussion in an unfair direction so that the conclusions to be drawn from the debate are untenable and un, un, incoherent. So uh, I should caution you. Don't talk about the Nazis and don't talk about Hitler unless it's the topic of the debate. The one thing that I'd, I'd like to reinforce uh, from my speech, nobody asked about it, was the organization Human Agenda. And the very first action item or, or reprioritized uh, value introduced included something called the duty of care. The duty of care is what we share with each other as members of a community or members of a society. And it's easy to gloss over that in an era of rapacious consumption and individualism and rugged uh, self-reliance, the things that we're instructed to think and believe in the United States. So that substitute value actually, I think, demands some consideration on all of our parts so that we don't end up atomized and uh, fragmented as, as a people. Is that just a social contract? Well, it sounds like the Zeitgeist like so, movement. Social contract. A little bit. The Zeitgeist movement and, yeah, here in March. and the idea of a social contract definitely come into play on this. So I wanted to also uh, mention that I attended a, a speech at the Goethe Institute downtown that was headed by a a uh, fellow who is an American, but he went to the United Kingdom to head the news station there. And on the basis of having lived there for something like 18 years, came back and provided a speech that was a compare and contrast of the European social model and the American social model. <coughs> Pros and cons of each. And his conclusion from first-hand experience was that many of the things that are aspects of the American social model look patently insane to people who are subscribed to the European social model. One of those things is the right to universal health care. Um, I found it a, a very convincing speech. Obviously, those European societies continue to maintain a social safety net far and away in excess of anything that we in the United States provide for ourselves as a duty of care. Another speaker already mentioned that in the United States we have an amalgam of, I guess you could call it, rank capitalism versus socialism. I agree with that. We have many social programs in the United States, not as many as in Europe, but we do have them. I think I better understand the question now that came from this gentleman sitting over here at the time um, regarding injections of socialism into the capitalist system, as though it was those injections that posed the problems with capitalism. So by inference, the suggestion would be that if capitalism were given free reign, the way the neoliberals would like, it would sort itself out and fix its own inherent contradictions. I have no such faith. Yeah. It's worth noting, I believe, that socialism is a correction or a corrective to the runaway excesses of capitalism. It's not an effective one because it continues to be shut down again and again and again in U.S. history. However, according to some analyses, the U.S. military is the largest social program run by the United States, more than Medicare, Social Security, public education, uh, municipal services, anything. The GI Bill was a good example of how the U.S. military stimulated the U.S. population.
One of the other things that came out of the Dostoevsky quote was the idea that we must accept the material world as our ideal. Anyone who argues in favor of improved living conditions or standard of living or life expectancy is in fact adopting that ideal. What they are overlooking, and I didn't have space in my speech to include, is the sort of death of community and the spiritual death and the ontological insecurity that we all feel in the modern era as a result of our fraying social system. The idea of doubling down with technology to fix the problems that have been created by technology is to me a damning deal with the future. We've made that deal with the future with nuclear power in the respect that nuclear power stations take more than two decades to, what's the proper term to shut them down? Decommission. 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 Germany's underway with that right now, but it's being met with a great deal of um, opposition because they recognize that it has immense costs, mm -hmm. but they also recognized around the time of the Fukushima accident that they couldn't keep their deal with the future to keep these plants operational into an unforeseen future to avoid catastrophic meltdown. <laughs> We have that very deal made on our behalves by the U.S. Department of Energy and others around the globe that we also can't keep, as though everything that's operating now will continue indefinitely for a thousand years or more into the future, which is, I'm not sure what the half-life of uranium is, but it, it, it will pose that kind of a, a duration far longer into the future than, than we can foresee reasonably. I will um, reinforce the idea that revolution is not necessarily led by the people at the bottom because they're desperate and they're powerless, but rather is led by the people in the upper class, or to use my term, in the technocracy. In Khan Kajmishra's book, he actually argues that the French Revolution, with its ideology and the Bolshevik Revolution with its ideology was driven by magazine and newspaper publishers more than it was by the people of the various countries or in fact their leaders. So those were folks who were ideologically possessed who pressed forward with revolution that was not necessarily um, original with the population, but was then indoctrinated or adopted by the population. And finally, the, the term for people put out of work by robots is called technological unemployment. That's being thrown out of work because a robot has come in to do the job that you used to do. I have one final bit. There were several books that I cited in my speech, uh, The Age of Anxiety by Pankaj Mishra, The U.S. versus Democracy by Paul Street, and the one called Richistan. But there were three other books I didn't really have time to work into my, my speech that I wanted to recommend. I can't find them. Send me the list, we can post them online with the YouTube deal. Here it is. One is uh, called Mean Girl, Ayn Rand and the Culture of Greed by Lisa Dugan. And it's basically an explanation for how uh, objectivism in Ayn Rand, her, her philosophy, if you want to call it that, provide coverage and actually convince a lot of people, including a lot of influential people, that greed is good. So this was Oliver Stone and Gordon Gecko before Oliver Stone and Gordon Gecko. Uh, there's another one called Make Mindfulness, How Mindfulness Became the New Capitalist Spirituality by Ronald Purser. It's a discussion of how something as honest and, and, and pure, if you will, as 
mindfulness, which comes out of a variety of Eastern traditions, including Hinduism, Taoism, um, life ways, not religions, has been co-opted by uh, American self-help gurus and transformed into a means of convincing the American public that the anxieties that they feel can be overcome internally with the adoption of the mindfulness practice, or meditation if you will, um, and that the anxieties are not the result, the proper result I should add, of external influences. And the final book I'd like to recommend is called Winners Take All, The Elite Charade of Changing the World by Anand Jirid Hadak Hararis. He's, um, he's an Indian American fellow who had um, close encounters, if you will, with uh, the rich, the philanthropic rich in particular, and how they've conducted a, not a psyops, but at least a, um, it, a disinformation campaign that they should be left alone and not raise the marginal tax rate to um, make them pay for the benefits that they've accrued over the course of the last 40 years. They should be left alone to direct their philanthropy where they want it to go. And so we see this with um, a number of okay. high profile philanthropists. Ted Turner was the first one to donate an entire billion dollars and then it became the billion dollar challenge. Uh, okay. I think Bill Gates has adopted malaria eradication as, as his post-work um, philanthropic effort. He says that that's all of a charade and that these efforts together, although they have good public appeal and good camera appeal, don't actually um, accomplish what they pretend to accomplish, but are in fact means of maintaining control over their own riches. That's all I have for you tonight. Thank you. Kevin out, Andy. Thank you, Mr. Holland. That's it for tonight, and we will see you next Saturday. Thank you for coming. We're out.